two more minutes. That was a nice little dance he had going there. Okay, so uh, it's 1 o'clock, so I guess we'll get started. Um, so uh, today, uh, I and uh, my colleague Amit Capella will be talking about parallel sequential scan, which unfortunately did not uh, make it into PostgreSQL 9.5. Oh. Uh, but we're, we're <laughs> but we're hoping that it will. Uh, We'll ho we're hoping to get it into uh, PostgreSQL 9.6 early in the development cycle so that we have time to shake out all the bugs before um, it actually gets released. Um, this is certainly the biggest feature that I've ever tried to get into PostgreSQL, <coughs> not necessarily in terms of its impact on users, although maybe, um, but uh, certainly in terms of the amount of uh, development time and effort of pl and planning that have gone into making it happen. And I'd like to just uh, thank a few people for being a part of that effort. Uh, Amit has done a, a huge amount of uh, work uh, on this, which I'm very grateful for. Uh, Noah was involved in the design of this feature while he was at Enterprise DB. And a couple of my other colleagues, uh, Amit Kandakar and Rushab Lathia uh, and Jeevan Chalke, wrote pieces of code that ended up uh, in some of the patches as well. So um, a lot of hands have touched this. A lot of thought has gone into it. Uh, obviously, Andres' uh, review has been uh, invaluable, even if it's sometimes made me want to tear the hair out of my head. Um, but I think we're getting very close to having this feature. And so I'd like to talk uh, today about um, the, the things that have been done and what remains to be done uh, and sort of what the status of the patches are. And Amit will talk about uh, the portions of that that are, that are his work, and I'll talk about the portions of that that are my work. Um, so uh, the, the overall status of this feature is that we've kind of been making uh, progress on this release by release. Um, in PostgreSQL 9.4, uh, we got sort of the very basic fundamental infrastructure facilities that we knew we were going to need in order to build this feature. Um, uh, Alvaro Herrera had added uh, background worker processes to PostgreSQL 9.3, um, but they ha all had to be started at the time that the server was started, which was obviously not going to work for parallel query. Um, so uh, I made those into dynamic background workers, um, which can be launched uh, while the server is running and can actually be started up and shut down uh, pretty quickly. Um, we also have a fixed size shared memory segment, which was not going to work for uh, parallel queries that might need to exchange large amounts of data. You can't just nail down that much memory in advance at server startup. Um, if you plan to sort a terabyte of data at some point during the server lifetime and you have enough memory to do that in memory, that doesn't mean that you have a terabyte that the server can permanently reserve for its entire lifetime. So, we really needed to have dynamic shared memory uh, in order to make this uh, a possibility. 
Um, and the other thing that we got in 9.4 was some very basic infrastructure for managing the contents of a dynamic shared memory segment. And the biggest piece of that was shared memory message queues. So you spin up a dynamic shared memory segment, and you have two processes attached to a queue that's stored in that segment, and then one can send messages uh, to the other. Uh, if you want to talk in both directions, you need two queues, one going each direction. Um, and that's obviously something that we can use uh, for a variety of purposes. We can move error messages or warning messages between processes as well as tuples. And we need to do both of those things. So 9.4, in the 9.4 cycle, basically what we got in place was a bunch of infrastructure that is targeted toward parallelism, but is actually pretty general. Lots of people are excited by dynamic background workers and using them for other things. Um, uh, a somewhat smaller number of people are excited about uh, dynamic shared memory, but that too is being used uh, for other things. And bugs in even in the uh, shared memory message queues were reported um, by people who weren't me. So that means that somebody actually took my code and used it to do a thing. That was not something that I, what was what was I was planning to do with it, which was pretty cool. Now in PostgreSQL 9.5 we made a lot more progress specifically toward parallel computation. Um, we got a, a series of things for error propagation. So it's now quite easy for your process to spin up a background worker. And the background worker throws the error. And the error is actually reported by the master process to the client with all of the bits of the error state, not just the error message, but the file number where it happened, the line number where it happened, the hint, the detail. All of that stuff gets collected it up collected and forwarded. And it works not only for error messages, but also um, for, uh, for logs and warnings and so on. Um, and so that leaves the actual feature uh, as the thing that isn't done yet. Uh, we have working patches for this. Uh, there are some unresolved issues with those patches that still need to be fixed. Um, but uh, it does work. And if you apply the right patches and you don't mind the things that aren't all uh, fixed yet, uh, you can try it out and say, hey, it works or it doesn't work for my use case, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, just a bit more detail about what we got done in 9.5. Uh, first of all, there was this message propagation stuff. We are actually using a slightly modified version of the front end back end protocol for the parallel workers to send their error and warning messages back to the master process. Um, so they, uh, they assemble uh, their uh, log or warning or error messages in exactly the same way that they normally would. They write them into one of these shared, message, shared memory message queues. And then the master uh, receives that message. Uh, and uh, without having to write a lot of code or doing anything, do anything particularly exciting in the master, that same message just pops right back out of the master. And it may not really be obvious that you need that. It may sound like kind of a, a boring uh, feature. And it is a boring feature, honestly. Um, but I think one of the hardest things about implementing parallelism is that there were a whole bunch of really boring things that were not exciting or glamorous to work on. But you had to have them in order for the feature to work. Because like, if you say, hey, would you like to do a project on error reporting? I mean, it's like, heck no, I want to make proc array lock faster, because that's cool. But you can't exactly have parallel query and not report errors, right? <laughs> I mean, that clearly isn't going to work. So this is stuff that, that uh, is now uh, behind us. And uh, there may be issues to resolve, but uh, we think it works. Um, so the other and probably bigger thing that we got in 9.5 was this concept of parallel mode and parallel contexts. Um, and this basically makes it much easier for the uh, master process to spin up a bunch of workers and to initialize the state of those workers so that it more or less um, matches the master. Now, it doesn't exactly match the master. And that's because we're not creating these worker processes by fork. Okay. In Postgres, in our architecture, every process in the system is a child of the postmaster process. And so that means that, uh, that the new worker process that's, that we're spinning up are launched by the postmaster. We contact the postmaster and say, please 
launch a worker process, and it does, and then that process basically has no state, right? It's just a copy of the postmaster that knows, hey, I'm a worker. So it doesn't have the same snapshot. It's not part of the same transaction. It doesn't know anything about locks. You know, it, it doesn't know any of the stuff that pertains to the transaction that started it. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, you know, even if we wanted to change the architecture so that not all processes had to be children of the postmaster, that wouldn't get us very far on Windows because Windows does not support fork. Uh, so we felt that we needed to take the, this approach. Um, so that means we need to worry about how we're going to synchronize all of the state to the worker. And we actually synchronize with the patch that went into 9.5 uh, an awful lot of stuff. Um, so this is all of the things that the worker process goes and loads up when it starts executing. All the libraries that your original master process had loaded, the worker goes and loads the same libraries. Uh, it connects to the same database using the same user ID. It sets all of its gooks to the same values that those gooks have in the original process. Uh, it gets the XID for the current transaction and for the top level transaction, which may be different if there are subtransactions uh, involved at the point where you begin parallelism. It gets the list of XIDs that appear uh, as committed to the original process, which is important for getting the MVCC visibility checks right. Um, it gets all the combo CID mappings uh, from the uh, from the um, from the original process, uh, for which you can blame uh, Heike. Um, you can also blame him for the fact that your tuple headers are four bytes smaller, so that's a good thing. Um, but uh, uh, it gets the active snapshot. It gets the transaction snapshot, which may be different. It gets the current user ID and the current security context. Now, the way that I came up with this list is I said, hey, Noah, can you give me a list of all the stuff that needs to be the same in these processes? <laughs> And he came up with pretty much this list. So then we went and implemented that. But it turns out that this is actually pretty good. Like It sounds like kind of a long and eclectic list with a bunch of different random stuff in it. But it basically boils down to two things. You need to have the same tuples visible in the parallel worker that are visible in the master under all circumstances, even if there are subtransactions, even if there are uh, all kinds of weird going uh, combo CIDs, you've been generated, open cursors, whatever. You have to have exactly the same MVCC semantics in the worker that you had in the master. So a bunch of this stuff is related to that. And you need to have the same GUCs because there's all kinds of pieces of code like input and output functions and all kinds of crazy stuff that depend on the value of GUCs. So if the GUCs are not all the same, it's hard to predict what will go wrong, but probably something will. Um, so uh, all of this really comes down to that. And then, of course, you need to have the same authentication information. We actually have inside the back end four different user IDs that are maintained in four different variables. And, all, and they can all be different. And the values all have to match in the parallel worker versus the master. So now this is all taken care of. And it turns out that once you take care of all these things, almost all of the back end code that you might want to run in a parallel worker runs just fine. One notable exception is you cannot allow anybody to do any writes. Because as soon as you start doing writes, things like your combo CID mappings can start changing, and the things will get out of sync with each other. So that doesn't work. Um, so, uh, so what do we have left? Um, so patches for 9.6. Um, the parallel mode and context stuff has one unfortunate omission right now, which is that it doesn't include any heavyweight lock handling. Um, and that's important because without that, um, if you spin up a bunch of parallel workers and a bunch of bizarre things that are unlikely to happen in real life actually do happen, then your thing will just deadlock, possibly without reporting that it deadlocked, or possibly with reporting it deadlocked, but leaving you go, wait, that shouldn't have deadlocked. Um, so it's an incredibly boring and tedious problem on which I've probably spent uh, 120 hours or more at this point trying to get this right and uh, convincing people that I've got this right. Uh, but uh, that's one of the things we got to nail down. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that nearly every uh, system-defined function 
is safe to run in parallel mode, but many user-defined functions will not be. Um, and there are a few system-defined functions that will not be. So we need to label our functions uh, with whether they do anything that is not safe to, to do in, in parallelism. Um, and in particular, like we need to know whether they might update any data. right? Because if they update any data and you try to do that in parallel mode, it's going to fail. So you want to fall back to non-parallel mode if your function, for example, does any updates. Or if your function uses any subtransactions, that's not going to work in parallel mode. So then that function is therefore parallel unsafe. Um, we have very, very few functions that we ship out of the box that fall into that category, but we do have some. Um, so this assessing parallel safety patch adds all of that labeling, and it arranges when we plan a query to search the query tree for any unsafe functions or any operations that write data. And if we find any, then we say, no problem, but there, this query will not be parallel, because if we tried to do it in parallel, it would fail. Uh, a lot of work, by the way, and much of this was, was Noah's work and uh, Amit Kapila's work, or was it Amit Kandekar? What not? Amit Kandekar, um, you know, was put into making sure that if you label the functions wrong, you'll just get an error rather than like a crash or silent bad behavior. So we put a lot of energy into trying to make it so that uh, you know, as much of this as possible would be figured out by the system automatically. There's some user activity required because of the halting problem. Um, but uh, if you do make a mistake and fail to solve the halting problem yourself correctly and therefore mislabel a function as being safe when it really isn't, we just want that to fail. We don't want it to blow up in a horribly messy way. Um, and then the last set of patches for um, 9.6 is around parallel sequential scan. Uh, there's kind of uh, two main parts to that. There's a bunch of things that need to be done to teach the executor specifically about parallelism. Um, we've taught the transaction system about parallelism, but the executor is a separate thing. And it needs to learn about parallelism, too. Every single module in the system needs to know a few things about parallelism that it need, didn't need to know before. Uh, and then we've got some new ex executor nodes, uh, funnel and partial sequential scan, which are actually going to be the things that are going to power this new uh, parallel sequential scan functionality. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amit to talk about uh, that stuff. Okay. Uh, so till now, uh, Robert has uh, talked about the general infrastructure we have built on, which he thinks is boring, but it is quite exciting for any <laughs> C developer uh, to develop. And then uh, using that, uh, uh, we have started working on uh, parallel sequence scan, uh, which is in now somewhat good shape and working. So. Uh, for this patch, we used uh, uh, two different nodes uh, to uh, implement it. One is the a funnel node, and another is the partial sequence scan node. So uh, in the funnel node, uh, basically a funnel node has uh, one child, and that child is run by uh, all the backend workers. And then uh, the other responsibility of the funnel node is to combine all the tuples uh, from various uh, workers, which they send after executing the plan, and uh, send it back to the client. And then uh, another feature uh, uh, suggested by Robert for this is that uh, for the cases when uh, not enough workers are enabled, or uh, workers are busy doing something else, like they are not sending the tuples on the tuple queue, or uh, back to the master, uh, the funnel node itself uh, can scan uh, the pages and uh, fetch the tuples. So these are the three uh, main uh, work done by this uh, funnel node. And then uh, partial sequence scan is a new node which actually does the scan uh, by, uh, for the table. So this node is responsible for scanning the table uh, part by part, like each worker scan part of the table using this uh, node. And together, it will form uh, the whole uh, scan. So uh, here is the simple example of uh, how uh, the plan uh, for uh, scan 
on a parallel scan will look like so what what this shows is that uh, there will be four uh, background workers uh, which will be used to scan the whole table uh, part by part and uh, together including the master they will scan the whole relation so which indicates that it will be uh, like faster when multiple uh, cpu resources are available so like uh, for the general infrastructure of the parallelism we have to share many things uh, as robert has explained in previous slides specifically for the query execution uh, we uh, again need some parts of the executor or the planner which needs to be passed down to the worker so that they can perform the scan so the the important ones are listed here and uh, are like this that the first thing uh, each worker needs is that they need some form of plan or some form of information which they can use to scan the table so master uh, backend forms the plan statement uh, which it sends to all the workers and which are uh, used by the worker backends to perform their work and second is uh, uh, for the uh, bind parameters kind of uh, which could be used in the prepared queries uh, to bind the parameters those also need to be propagated to the workers so that they could uh, perform the execution for such kind of uh, queries and then the third and important thing uh, for doing the execution is param exact parameters uh, which are required for uh, the evaluation of some uh, kind of sub selects so these are uh, also needs to be uh propagated to each of the workers and once this information is passed to the uh, uh, worker each worker is now uh, capable to perform the scan and after performing the scan each of them have to send back the tuples back to the master for which we use the uh, tuple queues which are established between uh, master and the worker backend and then uh, finally uh, we need some statistics information as well like for pg stat statement or the explain statement uh, for the work done by each of the worker so some instrumentation information also needs to be shared between master and the worker backends so these are the top level of information we need to uh, share among uh, master and worker backends to perform the scan correctly and completely so the another important part of this is the parameters which uh, we have planning to introduce to uh, so uh, so that parallel query could be tuned or uh, could be made to work uh, so here the first thing is the parallel sequence scan degree some of the other databases call also call it as degree of parallelism basically th this parameter will indicate that how many uh, parallel background workers could be used for a particular parallel operation so uh, basically in a given in a query if there are multiple parallel operations something like for append relation or for some other thing so each parallel operation could use uh, these many uh, workers mm -hmm. if available So we are uh, for sub query could be there, right? We have clause, and then also the the the, the, the sequential scan that is being uh, performed here is not necessarily at the top of the query tree and could have a filter condition applied to it, which will be executed by the workers, not by the master. So if they if they see an expression that they need to evaluate, that expression might refer either to bind parameters or to param exec parameters. Uh, so uh, the next thing is uh, the tuple communication cost now uh, various uh, workers need to communicate the tuples back to the master backend so there is uh, some cost associated with it so depending on the uh, kind of communication we could set up the uh, cost for that and then the biggest cost in all this is the setup of the workers or the dynamic shared memory which we uh, do in the beginning of the 
parallel operation. So uh, th this is uh, the cost, like parallel setup cost, which which includes the setting up of a dynamic shared memory and the workers and all the stuff we uh, do before starting the parallel scan. Uh, He's asking how big is the parallel setup cost? I think it, uh, relative to other, it will be the biggest cost, maybe in 1,000 or I don't know exactly, still. 10 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is, this is not for scanning a one megabyte table. <laughs> if you think one megabyte is a, is a table that's big enough to parallel sequential scan, uh, get, get out. Right now there is uh, no plan, but I think it is a very good uh, research topic that we try to optimize or uh, try to estimate based on uh, this many workers and uh, this much work and this many tuples. But at this stage, I think we want to make at least the first version where uh, something genuine could go. Yeah, so anyone who's ex also anyone who's expecting this to have perfect performance characteristics in the first version. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have bad news for you. <laughs> So uh, it should probably just be parallel degree, not parallel sex scan Absolutely. degree. Exactly. I was noticing that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. it really is controlling the degree of the funnel, yeah. which is not supposed to be specific to, to the sequence scan. Yeah. It started with it, but I think this is a good review. You're, you're going to re rename that after the talk. Yes, we are having all of the same problems that we have with Workman. Every single one of them. And you know, the, the reason why we have the problem with Workman, the root of the problem with Workman, is because uh, the way the planner algorithm works is by figuring out the cheapest plan for each subtree of the join tree. And it's not clear how to say, well, you know, if we do this plan here, then some other part of the tree isn't allowed to choose its best plan anymore because now that plan uses too much memory. So it's just like there could be a general refactoring of the planner which could try to maximize the total resource usage across the whole uh, plan tree rather than just considering the, research, uh, the, the resource cost of each portion of the plan tree individually. Um, but one thing we are not doing is adding that project into this project. <laughs> Let, let's answer question number one. <laughs> yeah. So here it uh, works something like this. If the uh, number of workers are not available, we'll continue with uh, the existing uh, workers, whatever are available, and we will use the uh, master backend as well to scan. If so that, that would be obviously the code I want to like an explain analyze the code you want to do. Explain analyze will. Yeah. yeah so uh, so what we're going to do is at plan time we're going to assume that the number of workers you said we should plan to use will actually be available at execution time. And if they're not, the query will still run, but just with however many workers we can actually get. So if you set uh, max uh, workers total system-wide to eight, which is the default value, and then you set parallel degree to 14, 
then you will be planning on the basis of assumptions that will never, ever work out in practice. But that's your problem because you put in silly settings. Yeah, uh, yeah oh, CPU coupled. Oh, yeah. This the is CPU coupled for, for double. For double. This is for double. Uh, you have to multiply uh, it in there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, if your couples are more, actually, this will cross, uh, so, uh, scale uh, accordingly. So it, it only takes one or a couple of milliseconds to spin up the parallel workers. But if you think about what a couple of milliseconds looks like in terms of our cost equation, it's a big number, right? Like that's a I mean, that could be hundreds of thousands or millions. You, you know, you, you can do a lot of scanning in a couple of milliseconds. But I think here confusion was that uh, that cost was for scanning all the tuples, tuple communication. But it is per tuple cost. And multiply by the tuple engineer. Yeah. Because of course, one of the things is that parallel sequential scan figures to work a lot better with a tight filter condition yeah. than yeah. it does with no filter condition. In fact, until we get some more query planner enhancements with no filter condition, it's probably a loser. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You're right. We kind of have that problem already with planned queries and then executing them. But here, depending upon the language, that can be exponential. So yesterday, I gave a lightning talk, saying that you know the biggest thing that needed to be worked on with respect to advancing foreign data wrappers toward sharding was making the query planner smarter, and. Uh, you know, that's probably going to be true here, too, which we'll actually get to in a couple of slides. Um, yeah. There's a lot of interesting query planner work that can be done here to make this much smarter, and a little bit of executor work that can be done to make this much smarter. But yeah, there are lots of query planner problems that are not solving, that we're not solving. And in addition to the ones that you can think of right now, I have every confidence that there will be additional ones that none of us are foreseeing at this point, which will bec only become apparent once this feature is committed and people really start banging on it. And that's unfortunate, because we'd like this to work perfectly in the first version, but it won't. right? And one of the crucial things is we're going to need feedback from everybody who tries this. In which cases did it work for you, if any? In which cases did it not work for you? There will definitely be some of those. And then we'll incrementally have work on improving it, right? It, it will not be perfect out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. So you only try to launch these workers when you start executing. If the worker becomes available later, you, you don't. Yeah, nope. Right. Okay. Yeah, that could be changed in the future. It might not even be that hard, but uh, yeah, right now it doesn't do that. You have a, at the same time, if you launch 10 queries, it kind of guarantees you. But yeah. As a, at every scan or every fetch tuple, we need to do that. I think in one of my back versions, it was there, and then some comments came. I think maybe from yeah, I mean, it's expensive to check again. every tuple whether you can launch them. I mean, ideally, in the long run, if we've got 50 workers available and 10 queries, we'd like the system to self-balance until each query is getting 10 workers. And then uh, you know, when one of the queries finishes, we'd like to reallocate those workers on the fly to the other queries. That's not going to be in the first version. <laughs> not going to be in the first version. Why not answer is quite simple. Like otherwise, maybe first version in itself won't we'll, be there. Yeah. yeah. I just had one. I, you, I think you mentioned this in the before, but now I'm a little unclear. So the worker processes get started once at the beginning of time? No. Yeah. Yeah. When we first try to when we first try to pull a tuple from the node, the node goes, "Oh, I'm actually being asked for tuples." And so that's and so that cost includes the cost of spinning up the process and doing all the activity on it. And I guess there's a cleanup cost associated with that. 
We don't have that in the budget. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think you could consider that to be part of the startup cost because it's either way you're paying it once every time you go through the node. I think uh, that's why we have told that parallel setup cost in itself is uh, big. Like in the previous version, we have argued quite some on the list that um, will there be a separate cost for that? And I think it didn't turn out to be. No. No, I'm not able to guarantee anything. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if, if the plan is planned as a parallel sequential scan plan, you're going to be running the parallel sequential scan code. You may be running it with no actual workers, in which case it's just going to be slower than if you were doing the regular sequential scan path. Hopefully not that much, but, but somewhat, right? So, uh, yeah. But I think uh, we plan to add something so that we give you one free check where as you have already told me that it's free check. Well, you, you don't really need to add something for that. I mean, you can do that with auto explain or, I mean, other tools we already have. No, explain. Auto explain. So these were user uh, faced, uh, facing some parameters which has generated quite some, <laughs> which is good, I think, uh, because most people are uh, bothered about that rather than internal workings. <laughs> but we have to, <laughs> we are here, so we have to share that. So uh, now we'll come to uh, parallel workers. So uh, as discussed, uh, like in one of the questions, parallel workers are mainly launched at the start of the execution. And they are uh, stopped as soon as we receive the last couple uh, uh, from the scan, in the scan, or during the rescan. Or third is at the end of the execution. So uh, why we need at uh, three different places to uh, try stopping it is uh, there are a couple of cases where uh, we might not be able to stop them at the end of the couple, uh, last couple. Uh, something like limit node or uh, such cases. So we have to uh, try stopping at all the three places wherever it gets uh, stopped uh, first. Then uh, each of the parallel workers will, uh, actually we, uh, in the previous slides I have told that the master backend will prepare the plan statement and send it to the workers. So what actually each worker will be doing is, it is executing the partial sequence scan node. Uh, where it will uh, get the tuples and send those tuples back via tuple queue to the master backend, which is executing the funnel node, and it will collect all tuples and send it back to the planner. Uh, during rescan, are you talking about merge joins or something else? Something like uh, anything, ne nest loop join uh, or... N now, if you're thinking it sounds like a terrible idea to have a parallel sequential scan on the inner side of a... Nest on the outer side, of inner or on the yeah. lower side of a nest loop, you're right. But the code still has to not crash if, for some reason, that plan pops out. Right, uh, like because we have some uh, parameters as zero value, so it could uh, right now select anything. Hopefully, we don't want it, but it should uh, handle those cases. The whole system goes down. It is uh, almost similar to any backend. If any backend in Postgres gets killed at any time by the UM killer, the whole system resets. Parallel workers don't change anything about that. That's. No. If somebody gets killed unexpectedly, they could be holding a spin lock at the time that they die and then you're screwed because the next person who tries to take that spin lock will sit there forever and spin. So yeah, if somebody gets killed, you're done. Does that one happen when we're in a critical cycle? No, it happens anytime you're holding a spin lock. Which is? Which is not the same as a critical section. No, no, a critical section, let's talk about that afterward because a critical section is something totally different. A critical section is when you need to promote error to panic. That's different. Yeah. Determinative back in space, really, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So let's try to get through a couple more slides here so we have a chance to finish the finish the and talk. There is some interesting talk, uh, <laughs> topic which Robert wants to cover. Like, that will be quite interesting for all of you as well. So uh, the other thing about parallel worker is like uh, there was a lot of discussion how, how to divide the work uh, between parallel workers. Like uh, we know that the, all the parallel workers will scan whole table uh, as a last uh, like uh, together, but uh, we have tried two kind of strategies here to uh, divide the work among the workers. One is uh, block by block. Like a as soon as the worker scans one block, he can uh, get the next block and scan that block. And second is fixed chunk approach, which as a prototype I have developed in the beginning. That in the beginning only master backend fixes the chunk. Okay, there are four workers, so uh, first worker will uh, basically scan from. Uh, first to n and then n to n plus like this. So basically uh, those two approaches were uh, tried out and we found that there is not much difference in uh, the performance data. So we are uh, preferring the block by block approach because it gives us the more dynamism and kind of uh, work allocation could be better. Like no one after finishing its work uh, could go uh, idle. So this is the kind of strategy we are planning to proceed with. Yeah, and are these blocks anyone that can be biased? Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, here is the last and interesting thing about the parallel sequence scan, which <laughs> is uh, about the data and uh, the performance it shows. So uh, these are, uh, basically I have uh, done a simple uh, test uh, with some 30 million rows and uh, ha having a table with one int and uh, char column. So here uh, the uh, sta SQL statement I have used is such that it contains some uh, function and some uh, condition. Like basically the function has uh, slightly uh, some cost. As Robert has mentioned previously, like if their filter condition is very cheap or there is no filter condition, actually it may not turn out to be good. So I have tried uh, that test. Uh, containing, uh, you can uh, evaluate equivalent to that there are some complex conditions in the bear clause. So here is the data. Here we can see that as the number of, uh, uh, the, as the degree of parallelism is increasing, the time is decreasing. For uh, all kind of, uh, I have tried three kind of uh, like filtered, uh, number of filtered rows. One is if, the, if our select statement selects 1% of rows or 10% or 25, I see in all those three cases, the uh, graphs and the readings are similar. Like as the uh, degree of parallelism mm. is increasing, uh, the time it takes is less. One second. And, and the, another point I have noted down here is that after some point of time, adding more workers won't help us. Either it keeps the uh, performance at the same level or it starts increasing due to the uh, worker overhead and unnecessary other uh, communication overhead. How many CPU workers do you have? This is much more like 90, okay. something, one eight. Same machine is even there. A lot. Enough. Enough. Now, with intensity test case, you are involved the real time or only uh, this uh, there is no uh, disk access is also there in this. There is disk access because this is so much high data, right? Oh, okay. Uh, right, of thirty million rows are there and one thousand row size per tuple. Thirty million That's rows. Not very That's not very big. That's only like thirty gigs. Thirty gigs. So how much shared buffers will be? Maybe. No, no, no. But, but that doesn't mean you're doing I/O. Yeah. I mean that machine has a gajillion bytes of memory in it. Yeah. So they all be in the, dis in the sub together. Files of. So are the yeah. three lines all sitting on top of each other in that graph? Yeah. yeah. It seems strange that there's not more of a gap because you should have a lot more tuples flowing through the queues yeah. at 25% of rows qualified than at 1%. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. you guys can test it. <laughs> <laughs> you can give us your numbers. Which work allocation strategy is 
block by block. So this is with the final patch uh, version, whatever I have sent, along with some of the other patches uh, of Rawit. Is there a single patch or is it in, I mean, is on GitHub somewhere? I think now uh, there are mostly two uh, patches. One, what, uh, uh, access planner safety patch and this one. Okay. And maybe there is heavyweight lock patch which Rawit is going to develop. Yeah, so this is about the parallel sequence scan patch and now uh, Robert will discuss some of the future work which we, we, we can do uh, with the parallel stuff. Yeah, so in the early versions of this, we just had one new executor node which was called parallel sex scan. Um, and we realized uh, eventually that that was, uh, um, you know, kind of too limiting, right? So we split it into two nodes, a funnel node and a partial sequential scan node. And you know the idea here is that if you're running uh, a funnel node, whatever is under that funnel node is going to get executed. A copy of that is going to get executed in every worker. And then the funnel is going to merge those output streams back together. Um, so Amit has been refactoring the code. and parallel sex scan degree is one that got missed, but trying to refactor the code so that the funnel node can run with anything, any other s executor tree uh, underneath it. Now that obviously is going to require more planner work, um, but uh, it, I think it's very promising in terms of squeezing more benefit uh, out of this. Um, so uh, here's an example. Um, you know, if you've got uh, if you've got this first plan up here at the top where you have a nested loop with a sequential scan and an inner index scan, um, in the first version of the patch, the current version of the patch, the best you can do is this plan right here. Right? You replace the sequential scan with a funnel over a partial sequential scan. Right? But if you think about it, that kind of stinks because that means that all the tuples come back to the master and then the master does this iterated index scan for every single one of them which seems like something that would be great to have a whole bunch of workers doing in parallel. I mean, assuming there isn't too much contention on the buffer locks, but uh, that's a uh, problem Andres is going to fix for us, I hope. Um, so, uh, so here's what would be a lot better. Um, here we pulled the funnel up, or pushed the nested loop down, however you want to look at it, so that uh, the, the, you know, we do the partial sequential scan, and then each worker does the index scan for the tuples that it gets from the partial sequential scan. And then only after performing that join uh, do you use the funnel to bring everything back together. So there are going to be problems here. And one of them is that one of the sort of nasty problems here from the planner point of view is that there's a lot of times when you, is that that funnel adds a lot of cost, right? That funnel is expensive because that's where you're paying the cost of starting up the workers. So you don't necessarily know until you've generated a lot of parallel paths which ones of those are actually going to turn out to be promising. So we're going to have to maybe think a little bit about how the planner part of this needs to work so that we don't waste time generating a whole bunch of parallel paths and then go, oh, wait, when you add a million to each of those, then they all suck. Um, so that, that's going to require some thought. But I think this kind of transformation suddenly turns once we have it, which again, it's not going to be in the initial version, suddenly turns uh, a feature that's maybe kind of useful and interesting for a certain class of queries into something that actually there's a reasonable amount of stuff that can benefit uh, from this. Now, it, you could also do this with a hash uh, join rather than a nested loop, but it won't be quite as good because every backend is going to have to build its own copy of the hash table. Fixing that is a whole different project. Um, with a merge join, you can consider this strategy, but it's probably hopeless because it's unlikely to ever be a good idea to resort uh, in every back end. Uh, well, maybe if the other side of the merge join is an index scan, it could work. Is it a funnel on top of another funnel? Uh, I don't know what that would mean. Well, planner could get creative and get around your worker even by a few funnel on a few things of silly or yeah, I don't think that really. We're not going to generate those plans today, but I'm wondering. I think we're going to try pretty hard to make it not do that. <laughs> um, now, another thing we can do, which I just found out today that Simon is very interested in actually making happen, is uh, 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 
speeding, uh, doing parallel aggregation, right? So if you're counting uh, a giant table uh, or taking the max or min or average or whatever of a giant table, the way our aggregation system works is that you start stuffing in values and you build up this thing called a transition state, which contains all of the information about uh, what you are, uh, you know, what the progress of your aggregation is so far. Um, and uh, then when you're done, you finalize that transition state and your answer pops out. Um, so that won't quite work here because you need to build up a set of transition states. You need to build up a transition state in each worker, then somehow ship those states back to the master, combine them, and then finalize that to give the user their answer. But that still feels pretty doable. You need some kind of partial aggregate node that runs under the funnel in each workers and spits out transition states. And then the funnel will collect those and combine them, uh, and uh, you'll be really happy. Um, and all we need is somebody to write a couple thousand lines of really hard code. So uh, should be no problem. What's the kind of summarized list of the difference between a funnel node and an, and an append node? Uh, well, so an append node has a series of different children that it runs one after another. And an append node has a single child that it runs multiple copies of at the same time. So there, there are other kinds of parallel nodes that might be useful besides, besides funnel. right? So you can imagine uh, a parallel append node that has a list of children and a pool of workers. And it hands out the children to the workers. And every time uh, one of the children finishes the child that it got handed, you pass that same worker the next child, and you just keep doing this until the pool of workers have exhausted all of them. So that would be a great parallel primitive, which would allow us to do all sorts of interesting things that is not funnel. Right? So it would just require building a new thing. Right? You could also uh, imagine a plain old append, an unmodified append node of the kind we have today, with a bunch of children that were all partial sequential scans. Right? So if you had a table with inheritance children, you could have the table, and it's got a whole bunch of partial sequential scans. And that could be, as long as those partial sequential scans can all line up correctly between all of the workers so that they, they, they know that there are six of them and each one matches up to its correct sibling, that can behave just like a single partial sequential scan. And for that, that uh, attack on the problem, you don't actually need any other parallel nodes besides funnel. I expect that in the long run, and probably even in the short run, somebody will want both. Actually, having both will probably be more of a long run thing. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Whatever happened to the initial idea of parallelizing sorts? Since that was probably the easiest thing to do, and you didn't have to think about sorts, what exactly? Yeah, so the question is about parallelizing sorts. I, I sort of started with the idea of parallelizing sort because I said, oh, you know, if I do parallel sort, it wouldn't even have to work for general purpose queries. It could just work for, you know, like index builds, right? Because the time it takes to sort the tuples for an index build can be long if the table is really big. And then you wouldn't have to do any of this fun query planning stuff. Uh, you could just have the parallel execution environment, but the number of workers to use could be declared. Um, I still hope to get back to that at some point, but I basically got hung up on the fact that I spent a long time writing uh, an allocator that could be used to allow the, as infrastructure for the parallel sort. And nobody liked it. Um, and so I decided to uh, opt for the approach of uh, doing something else and coming back to that problem well, at a later time. Yeah, I mean, in the end, I'm pretty happy with this because I wasn't very happy with how useful this was going to be when it was just a parallel sex scan node. But now that we've got the partial sex scan node separated from the funnel, I actually think there's a lot more potential for this to be used for interesting things. I still do think things like parallel sort and parallel vacuum uh, are going to be things that people really, really want. Um, because even if your workload is mostly OLTP, 
you will sometimes have these bulk operations where you need to do a ton of work all at once. You need to vacuum an enormous, you know, you normally read one row from at a time from an enormous table, but every once in a while you need to build an index on it or vacuum it or do something else. And so for those things, those kinds of, of things are going to be uh, really useful. Um, but I just kind of made a, I just sort of made a tactical decision that this felt like a more uh, reachable first goal. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's where we ended up. That may have been a bad decision. It's possible I would be farther along if I'd done something else, but uh, you know, you kind of only, kind of only live your life forward. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how it all shakes out, but yeah, it's it was it was just sort of a strategic decision that got made. Yeah. Okay, we're kind of out of time. Uh, feel free to grab me for questions afterward. Thanks for coming.